good yarn tips. Is this microphone as strong as the other? Nope. Okay. How's this? Much better. Have, should I go back over all the jokes I told already and just retell them since you might not have heard them in the other microphone there? Only the good ones. Gary, I'd like to see you in my study after services. <laughs> this summer, as many of you may know already, I was in Malawi with a group of Sinai volunteers breaking ground on a new school in a small village. It was the culmination of our time together as a Sinai Circle and in partnership with a wonderful local nonprofit named Build On, we raised the funds and traveled to the community. And we were lucky this time to have plenty of translators moving amongst us as the 10 of us spent four days hauling, digging, cutting, and wheeling the raw materials. We were by all definitions, the unskilled labor. And the presence of those bilingual Build On employees were so great because they allowed us to have ongoing conversations with the villagers. We discussed politics and social issues, diet and economic hardship. We talked about how airplanes worked and we showed them pictures of our families and of Temple Sinai. I was particularly touched by the Malawian who told me that he would like Temple Sinai to come to their village so that they could all become Jewish. I was surprised and I asked what he knew about Judaism that would make him say that. And his response was, any religion that teaches people to go so far and to work so hard to help strangers seems like a good religion. That was the most wonderful compliment and expression of gratitude that I could have received. Somehow it didn't seem like just the right moment to speak with him about the traditional details involved with men becoming Jewish. <laughs> but it's caused me to reflect on the question, was it my Jewish influence that led me to do such a thing, or was it just the values of my upbringing? Obviously, it's impossible to separate. I was raised in a family a lot like yours, probably. The messages of my parents' values were so deeply aligned with those that I learned in religious school that I can't know which came first. As I grew through my stages of maturity and education, I learned a lot more about other sorts of religious messages, both within Judaism and other traditions. Most of what I learned emphasized the same beautiful values of universal human rights and sacred responsibility. And of course, there were other messages, including some found here in Judaism that conflicted with everything I'd absorbed as centrally important. I can show you the Jewish texts which declare our chosenness and by extension our preferred access to God's truth. There are too many ancient sources that decree harsh punishments on those who would stray from rabbinic authority or right behaviors. Those are within the Jewish tradition. There are Christian traditions that preach fundamentalism, positions on who gets into heaven, there are to be found Hindu teachings, which can deliver painful realities on the unpreferred classes. And we've all witnessed what happens around the world when any religion, when any religious leader projects righteous anger and judgment upon others who rejected their tradition's teachings. Just ask Salman Rushdie. No religious tradition I know is immune from these abuses of power and message and human vulnerability, which is why I've become so grateful that Temple Sinai's expression of Judaism does not participate in that sort of narishkeit. As religious progressives, we may sometimes take for granted how ingrained it has become for us to actively consider the religious messaging we receive and the privilege that we enjoy, which allows us to embrace the good and to leave behind the evil. I stumbled upon an author this year that many will have read. I mentioned him last night. Rabbi Rami Shapiro teaches, we welcome all religious teachings that promote dignity, justice, compassion, humility, respect, awe, and love for all beings. 
We reject, he said, all religious teachings that promote fear, hatred, and the exploitation or demonization of the other. My question to you is this. From where you sit and from what you can see, does it appear that Temple Sinai's delivery of Judaism holds up to that standard? Is that not, after all, the central mission for our congregation? Are there any other roles and responsibilities that you could think of that should outweigh that? Of course, there are other important goals that we also hold dear. We seek to be a community of support during times of anti-Semitism. We strive to be a place with respect for different understandings of God, whether or not they are our own. We're raising the next generation of the Jewish community with strong, positive identities. We create a place for sacred conversation about Israel. We proudly serve as a place for bagels and lox on Sunday. That's the preservation of Yiddishkeit culture. And we enthusiastically work to become a home where individuals can connect with people who share your interests, which is what led to Sinai Circles. All but the newest members of Temple Sinai, and there are a lot of you, by now are well aware that the Temple Sinai and Tel Rav families have recently made a long-term commitment to each other. My impact over the last 10 years in this community and the trust that we feel in each other has provided me with a mandate to chart a course into the future. I think it's possible for me to say quite simply that when I retire in 19 years, and I don't think you're going to have to worry about extending my contract that extra five to 70, but we'll see. My primary goal is to leave the leadership of this congregation in the hands of my successor, who will be well positioned for continued success and impact. We know that the fundamental changes to our broader society and the existential changes facing us in the future will demand a different kind of Judaism and that it won't be simple. We will need one that is foundationally and fiercely committed to the same core values that have kept us strong for 3,000 years. And we have to be open to achieving that in new forms. This is the right time to be considering those changes, the changes to our world and the rapidly evolving needs of the Jewish people. Charting a path for this community into the future is some of the most important work that we can do right now. You know, when I'm not with you celebrating births and b'nai mitzvah and weddings and teaching your children and mourning your losses at your side and all those other things that we also do. Rabbinic colleagues, sociologists, and futurists all have predictions about where we might be headed and prescriptions for what we should be doing about it. Locally, a team of Sinai leaders have come together and are pushing each other to ask the right questions. I've been reading and speaking to today's most innovative Jewish thinkers, including Cantor Micah's husband, Rabbi Ben Spratt, whose new book on the future of Congregational Judaism will be discussed after services on Yom Kippur morning. And we've begun to set up parlor meetings to gather data not just from those who are already happily a part of Temple Sinai, but from those children and grandchildren of yours who would likely never step foot in a temple. We've been seeking feedback from Temple Sinai leadership and participants alike, and we will be inviting you to share your thoughts in the coming months. What we're learning is pointing us in a direction, and here is a little of what is taking shape. Think about your children and your grandchildren and see if you can imagine them speaking these opinions. The traditional words of prayer are obstacles for many. They just don't believe in and will not be satisfied by what the prayers are literally saying. How many of them are likely to be coming back to shul in the future to use the words of these very same prayer books? We still speak too much about the God of the Bible, as if that's the only image. How many of your heirs believe in that God of our earliest traditions, the one that judges us and decides who's been naughty and who nice? 
How many of them would want to transmit that God to their children if there were another option? Your children and grandchildren are committed to the same social responsibility that Judaism teaches, but not necessarily the particularism inherent in our medieval language. How many are likely to describe themselves as the chosen people? And how many Judaism as the only way to raise up their children as good citizens of the world? And they find beauty and spirituality everywhere, not just the sanctuary. How many of them are likely to say that they are spiritual, but not religious? We just need to show them that this is a false dichotomy when you're practicing good religion. It will remain an evolving project. But I feel safe in saying today that the core elements of our vision will include evolving our language and our delivery and the theologies that we use today in order to help your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to speak their truths thanks to their Jewish identity rather than despite our messages. It may sound dramatic and unnerving to enter into the process of reevaluating our traditions, but in fact, that is what is happening in Congregational Judaism. Let me share some examples of the changes that have already taken shape at Temple Sinai over the recent years. These are demonstrative of my own evolution as a spiritual leader, but also our evolution as a congregation and the evolution of the reform movement worldwide. Those who've been paying attention and could compare my sermons from 2012 when I arrived to today would see that my language and my messages have been changing. You would also note the congregation's openness to the congregants' needs. A few Fridays back, we had one group gathered here in the Greenberg Chapel with Cantor Micah for Shabbat worship, but I was with more than 50 Sinai members who live in New Canaan. The Silver family hosted a dinner and a Shabbat pool party, and they voted with their splashes. These are individuals who needed to be with each other, a Jewish family on Shabbat evening, but they wouldn't have come to Temple Sinai. Was that a valid expression of Judaism, of Shabbat values? I certainly think so. Similarly, last week, a group of Sinai volunteers gathered with me to do some manual labor for a local elder, a 92-year-old Italian Catholic woman, and we did it on Shabbat. Someone commented on it, playfully, I responded, that this seemed like a fabulous way to celebrate Shabbat with our Kihila Kedoshah, our sacred community, even if it violated the orthodox dictates about Sabbath observance. You might remember that last Yom Kippur, we did not recite the prayer Unatana Tokef. Following a year with so many deaths from COVID, we could not read liturgy that explicitly stated that the previous Yom Kippur, God had decided all those people were marked for death that year. Without that prayer, was it still a Yom Kippur service? Of course it was. This morning, we've made the decision not to read Haftarah, and not because we started 30 minutes late, <laughs> and not just because it's an outdated practice that emerged from a liturgical gap that doesn't exist any longer, and not just because it takes up time while failing to create deep meaning for any of the people that we consulted on the decision. No. We removed Haftarah because we have 40 children downstairs who deserve to hear Torah and Shofar on Rosh Hashanah, but have Shpilkes, and they can't sit through a long service. So we rearranged the service. We moved the Torah reading and Mike Stone's sounding of the Shofar to the very end so that they can participate. First, downstairs in meaningful holiday programming, and then they'll come upstairs with a Sorry, they're down there with more uh, Erica and a team of adults. Don't worry, we didn't just let them run wild. <laughs> and then they'll come up here and join us for the good stuff at the end. There was a higher purpose, making the most meaningful use of our time together. When the traditions add to that goal, we employ them 
when they get in the way, will consider alternatives. Speaking of considering alternatives, <laughs> just wait until you see what we came up with for Tashlich this afternoon. There's a giggle in the room from some of you who know. There aren't many of you. It's a top secret. Suffice to say, there was a lot of thought that went into it, and we can guarantee that you have never seen a tradition of Tashlich moved into the modern moment like this. Even if you don't typically come back to Tashlich at 3 p.m., this might be a year to do so. Plus, there's free ice cream, an ice cream truck. How much of our practice and our tradition and our liturgy can be adapted before it loses its Jewishness? Maybe we should look to our history for some reassurance that what we're doing is not anything unusual. Abraham single-handedly created a new religion to meet the sensibilities that he knew to be most true and most important. He abolished polytheism for us once and for all. Moses single-handedly turned the Israelites toward a revolutionary, centralized leadership structure for our people. And then we found our feet again after being scattered across the ancient world by Babylon. And in an ongoing way, we were led to a creative and novel form of Judaism with the destruction of the rabbi, excuse me, the destruction of the temple by the Romans. Okay. For those of you who are streaming, I accidentally said the destruction of the rabbis, and a number of people sat up eager in their seats. <laughs> we turn to a new kind of leader, the rabbis, convinced uh, that the Jews needed to let go of their emphasis on the cultic practice of animal sacrificial worship, and instead to focus on the inner life of the individual. And we really got good at figuring out how to update everything every time we were expelled from whatever country had been our home. We changed our theologies, our liturgies, our mysticisms, our art, our clothing, our food. It was all based on wherever became our new home and whoever became our new hosts. Even our reform movement itself was a major departure from tradition, and it allowed for important growth. These moments in time were all difficult and sometimes painful memories for our people, but they were also crucial to see our management of these moments as a huge change, maybe as the only way that Judaism survived. Are we at one of those moments right now? I think maybe. Rendered dizzy by the ongoing effects of the pandemic and climate change and social media, we're faced with the challenge and the necessity and the responsibility and the opportunity to rethink the basis of how Judaism works. Not just that, I think Judaism is a secret weapon to combat all those negative external trends when I think of religion and the dire reports like that of the Pew Research Center a few years ago, I imagine religion struggling to maintain its toehold in the world against those massive external influences. But all the things that we say we hate about the direction of the world today can find their antidote and maybe even their cure right here. This is another modern story of David and Goliath with Judaism playing the role of David. But Malcolm Gladwell taught us that there was no miracle in that story. The imposing, overwhelming behemoth that was Goliath never had a chance against puny little David. Why? Because David had the perfect weapon. In the hands of a soldier who knew how to use it, the sling that he used to fire a lethal projectile right at Goliath's forehead was unparalleled in its effectiveness. If we get Judaism right, it too is the perfect response to our ailments of emotional isolation and moral degradation, societal erosion, and cl climate collapse. Here's what we know intuitively. 
and is supported by the research about your children and your grandchildren. They are deeply principled. You did a great job in transmitting a sense of purpose to them. They want to feel like their lives are meaningful and that their efforts are making a difference. But they also appreciate how sacred their time is. They are aware that they only get, on average, 4,000 weeks to work with in this life. You know, some of you are doing the math. It's 80. And they'll, they will not and they should not tolerate something that is of subpar quality or somehow inefficient or inauthentic. They are impatient. They want to see the change too quickly. If they don't find satisfaction in their jobs or relationships or their online connections, it can lead to depression or worse. Some of them are already wandering Jews, and I fear that without us, some of them will be lost for far more than 40 years. All that said, I think we're going to be sitting right here, right where you are, when I deliver my final Rosh Hashanah sermon in 19 years. But only if we're open to staying relevant for them and the world in which they live. They and you are looking to Judaism and Temple Sinai for three significant value adds to our lives. One, we want Temple Sinai to help us make meaning of the way we live our lives. Two, we're looking to Judaism to provide ways of speaking truth about what the world using God, our val about the world using God, our values and traditions in ways that are consistent with our beliefs. And three, we will look to this, our Jewish home, to help in diminishing the sense of isolation by providing a structure for living those meaningful, truth-based lives. I am a Jew is not the end of the declaration. It is the beginning. There is going to be a lot of experimentation here. There may be elements that we play with and then change back the next year because they didn't work. But we must remain open to congregational growth, else we stagnate. Temple Sinai is going to continue to be seen as a leader in the congregational world. Other synagogues around the country already regularly call Larry and more Erica and me to ask how we administer the programs that we're running. Others already see Temple Sinai as leaders in the evolu evolution that they too know must take shape. We are the ones modeling how tomorrow's Judaism is already being created today. So in closing, allow me to share a wonderful anonymous teaching that I provide to our new Temple Sinai trustees each year. It is called Live Shuls and Dead Shuls. Live shuls are constantly changing. Dead shuls don't have to. Live shuls have lots of noisy kids who run around and disturb the service and drive the rabbi bats. Dead shuls don't. Live shuls expenses always exceed their income. Dead shuls take in more than they spend. Live shuls are constantly thinking about the future. Dead shuls worship their past. Live shuls focus on people, keeping them growing. Dead shuls focus on the building, keeping it neat and clean and quiet. Live shuls are filled with tithers. Dead shuls are filled with tippers. Live shuls dream great dreams. Dead shuls rehearse nightmares. Live shuls don't have can't in their vocabulary. And dead shuls have nothing else but. Just look around. Here, virtual, Temple Sinai is a live shul. And we have a wonderful road ahead of us together. Good yontem.